uh, welcome back, um, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, this is going to be part three of our deep dive into the uh, the Sutra on the Manifestation of Lights. So that's the Sutra that we've been looking at. Uh, really quickly, just to let you know, uh, part one was, I feel like we were basically just going over the theme of light in Buddhism. Um, this is a very curious little sutra. Um, I kind of have already mentioned that this is really unlike a lot of the other sutras that I've done on Sunday nights. Um, and so we just kind of needed to talk about how this is a little different. And so we discussed the idea of light and we were introduced to our child named Moonlight, this little boy named Moonlight, who asked the Buddha about all of these different lights. Where, how did he get, how did he acquire all of these different lights? And, um, you know, this sutra is, like many sutras, it's a poem. It's a very long poem. So the Buddha gives his answer in verse. And I am reading from and translating from the Chinese version of the sutra. And the Chinese is in verse. And what I wanted to let you know is that this sutra has, well, it has some interesting transitions. I think it's kind of maybe you could divide it into six sections, maybe six parts in that sense. I think we will basically go about six or seven sessions in total for this. But these transitions, for example, where we left off last time, I had just finished reading the first hundred verses. So that was part two, was the first hundred verses of the Buddha's reply. And if you weren't here, the basic, um, except for the very beginning of that poem, meaning the Buddha's response, it was a long list, almost a hundred verses of these lights where the Buddha was saying, I also have a light, the name of which is, is this. And it arose, this light arose from, and then he gives these different activities. So that was the first hundred verses. And what I want to let you know, and it's not something, it's not something you would find out in the standard English translation of this sutra, um, especially because of where we're at right here. There is a, a, sh uh, a shift. There's a, 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 the poetics changes. Um, you, you could say the Buddha switched his flow up, you quite frankly, because the idea is, is that he's moving from a certain meter, rhyming in a certain way, and now he changes, the, uh, literally changes the rhyme scheme. So where I left off last time, we had finished, and it's really hard to go into great detail about all the, the beautiful poetics that are going on in this, but what I mentioned last time was the way that all of these different lights for example, just for example, the last few of these was about uh, that he has, the Buddha says he has a light, the name of which hasn't even appeared. <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't come into existence yet, right? It arose from extolling the unarisen. But then the next line is, I also have a light, the name of which is not arisen. It arose from extolling the unmanifested. And so the idea is, is that the, the lines of the poem sort of start riffing on the, off of each other. And so there's just some beautiful uh, lang language, wordplay, if you will, going on. And that's going to continue tonight. And so what I have planned for us this evening is to go over the next 60 verses. So the next 60 uh, lines or verses that are the Buddha's answer. So this is where he shifts his, his rhyme scheme. And 
but he's, it's still sticking with the same general pattern, which is that he's describing the names of these lights. And these first, I'm actually going to read, I think, 63 verses, because the first six or the first three, they really set up the pattern here. So let me just read these first three or four. Uh, yeah, just the first three, we'll go over it a little bit, and then we'll start getting into these uh, sort of verse by verse. So again, it's difficult to capture this in English, but there's been a transition in the way that the rhyme is working. But the Buddha goes on to say to our young boy, Moonlight, I have a light called expressionless or ineffable, unspeakable. It can bring all sentient beings to maturity. I have a light called the original nature of dharmas. Its light can move or shake a million lands. I have a light called taming Mara. The majesty or awesome majestic power of this light causes Mara to be subdued or causes Mara to be tamed. So those are the first three. Then the fourth line introduces a pattern that will continue for the basically the remainder of these 60 verses. And the Buddha says, I have a light called merit banner, one who holds its name is free from danger. So let's, we need to analyze that and go back to having a talk about light, kind of just kind of what's going on with this poem. So the, the hundred verses that I read in part two and the verses I'm reading tonight, they focus primarily on the names of these lights. And the names, of course, have been descriptive of these lights, of the qualities of these lights. So the idea of, of uh, the, the light whose name hasn't even arisen yet, right? That's kind of describing the light and describing the nature of it in that way. But of course, what's tricky about language is this problem where language has two sides to it. Language has a phonetic side, which is sort of the sound of things. And then it has a meaning side, what these words mean. What I'm getting at is, is that a section or a line, a verse, like I just read, where it says, I have a light called merit banner. One who holds its name is free from danger. So what I'm getting at is, is that this section is about, there's a verb, there's a very particular verb that gets used for the next 60 verses. And it's the verb that I'm translating here as hold. It might be retain in other translations. I believe in our standard English translation here, it is, they go with hold. So one who holds, I'm going with one who holds. But what does it mean to hold a name, right? Well, that's where I want you to know that the particular Chinese character that is, well, I won't be able to zoom in on it. I should have wrote it down, but the particular Chinese character that's being translated as to have this hold, it, it's sort of, what's interesting about it actually is that it is the way that the Chinese translated the Sanskrit, the root Sanskrit word dar, as in dharma, or dharana, or dharani, any of these words, these Buddhist terms that are about having or holding, dar, the Chinese had a particular character that they used to um, translate and actually 
it seems like actually they were both transliterating and translating because this Chinese character does have this kind of dr, dr sound to it. So regardless, it's difficult to explain what does it mean to dar, to jir, this Chinese character, to dar a name. And that's where it becomes kind of important to have this conversation about how words and these things, they have a sound, but they also have a meaning. So I have a light called Punya Devaja, one who holds its name is free from danger. Now that's a different thing. That's saying something different because I said it in the be in my best saddest attempt at Sanskrit. But we, you know, and there's dictionaries that help you do this, but you can reverse translate Chinese to Sanskrit. And we kind of have a very good understanding of what words the Chinese use to translate certain Sanskrit terms. And so it's pretty easy to back translate when the Chinese say, oh, 我有光明富的, right? This, I have this light called merit banner. You could translate it literally that I have a, a light called merit banner, right? Like in English, merit banner, or the Sanskrit punya, merit, and devaja, banner. In the coming section here, the next 60 verses, I believe, you know, we are to really be, um, if one wants to say, be free from danger, <laughs> you can do so by holding the name of this light. And I think you would need to hold it in kind of the original language, because it's kind of like a mantra that way. Mm. So just want you to kind of uh, keep that in mind for the going forward. But then there's an even more interesting kind of linguistic poetic twist going on, which is that for the next, I think it's eight. Yeah, for the next like eight verses, each of these is a light that is something banner. And so a banner is like, uh, one of these, uh, like a, a pennant, a banner. And the idea is, is that you hold it. It's actually a position in like ROTC and in the army, a banner holder, one who holds the flag, one who holds the banner. So there's an interesting linguistic twist going on with like, I have a light called banner, something, something banner, one who holds that light or the yeah. name of that light. And then in this case, if you hold the name of the light, Punya Devaja, Merit Manor, it makes one free from danger. That's all just the linguistic level of trying to, you know, translate these verses. But now let's zoom way, way out. <laughs> and really kind of get it what that might mean, because we, that's what I want to go through with you this evening. So I already discussed in part one and two that these lights are mysterious, but it's probably best not to think of them as, as uh, like photonic light beams in that way. But I gave a whole talk about like the light of knowledge and that there's other ways to think of light in that way. You can also kind of, like in this case where we're talking about punya or the cultivation of merit, the cultivation of virtue, cult cultivation of punya, there's a way in which, you know, we talk about somebody like a, a Thich Nhat Han, a Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, these people who have cultivated good roots, who have really developed a lot of punya, we kind of talk about how they they glow, like they have a glow about them in a way, a shine or something like that. The idea is, is that when one cultivates virtuous practices and sort of is purified in, in a lot of ways, and this, of course, 
a, a good pure diet doesn't help the skin in that sense. But the, what I'm getting at though, is that a, there's a certain quality of a person that can kind of beam. And again, it's not necessarily photonic light, but it's kind of uh, more of more of an expression in that sense that they're very bright or they, they again, they glow. So keep all of that in mind as we go through these different lights and that the Buddha acquires these just different lights. And now he's telling us how to acquire these different lights. And so there's a relationship here between the cultivation of merit, the merit banner, and being free from danger. Now, I don't want to, and actually, I don't want to belabor each of these because I don't think, eh, like, I think it's actually sort of would be in poor taste in that sense to define what each of these is saying in that way. I'm going to give you some suggestions or way to think about these things, but I just want to draw your attention to look at the way these are functioning, the name of the light, and then how one goes about um, retaining it in that way, or what what comes about. Yeah, Tanya. So if they're saying to hold the name, not necessarily the content or the meaning of the light so i think it's a tricky place where it would it would be most beneficial to be doing both which is to have this sort of original sound of the name which is in sanskrit we we understand but then it, to know what that sanskrit means now you're really now you're cooking if you know what i mean <laughs> All right, let's do a few more of these, and then I think it'll become more clear what I mean. So the next of these is, he says that I have a light that is called the, a banner of power or banner with power. One who holds its name is free from bitterness and resentment. Now, again, we have the problem of banner of power or banner with power. This is some kind of Bala Devaja. Bala is power, Devaja is the, the banner, but I don't think I've gotten this one exactly right because it's not just the power banner, it's a banner possessing power. So I believe the Sanskrit would, not, would have a little bit more to it. So don't quote me on the way to say this in Sanskrit. And, I, and again, I'm not going to be able to back translate each of the names of these, but I just wanted you to be aware that that would be ideal. So I have a light whose name means in that sense, right, powerful or with power. And one who holds its name is free from bitterness and resentment. Again, I think there's a really subtle relationship going on between those two things in that way just to give you like a sense of it. From a Buddhist point of view, <laughs> it would be a very, very powerful position to be in, to be in such a state of mind that you don't get angry, bitter, or resentful. And what the idea of, that I'm thinking of when I hear that verse, when I hear that line, is it's a kind of a classic Buddhist, Buddhist idea, which is when something or someone has managed to get a, a rouse out of us, right? To get us angry or we become bitter or resentful, there's a way that where you can look at that where that thing or that person that is causing that they have one they have one over on you <laughs> in that sense they're on the, you're at their mercy and so to actually rise to a state where you're as many buddhist texts talk about imperturbability totally imperturbable that state of being imperturbable nothing could get a rise out of you 
very powerful place to be in. And so that's the way that I would read that one, this light, this light that is called the banner of power and one who holds its name is free from bitterness and resentment. I have a light called tranquil banner. One who holds its name is free from desire. So similar idea as the one I just mentioned, this idea of kama, desire, kama chanda in that sense, and this being tranquil, right? This Buddhist code for tranquil meditation, shamatha, sati, dhyana, samadhi, all of these things speak of tranquility. And the idea is, is that that state of tranquility is a state that is free of wanting and desiring, similar to bitterness and resentment and anger, but not so averse from things, but actually moving towards things. And so this is kind of a complement to that, which is the idea of dealing with bitterness and resentment here in terms of being free of desire. And the idea is I have, I got this I have this thing about me, right? The, the Buddha is kind of saying, right? That I have this thing about me of tranquility. I have this light of tranquility. Well, Buddha, how did you acquire that light of tranquility, right? Well, what I acquired it from being free from desire. That's how the, free, the first hundred verses read. This is saying one who holds on to this name right? Meaning this tranquility, this tranquil banner, one who holds that name is free from desire. I have a light called Dhyana banner. One who holds its name is free from wrong action or free from transgression is another way to read that. Free from, you could read the Chinese a number of different ways, but the idea is our classic paramita of meditation, dhyana meditation. I have a light called dhyana, Diva, dhyana Devaja. That would be the name of that banner. One who holds its name becomes free from wrong action. And of course, if one's in a, in a tranquil meditative dhyanic state, it becomes hard to commit transgressive actions in that sense. It kind of is almost impossible in that way. I have a light called name hearing banner. One who holds its name receives praise. So this is one of those ones wide open to interpretation. All of them are wide open to interpretation. As you read on in this sutra though, little clues come out about what this one probably refers to. And the idea is, is that this sutra later on will start talking about those who are fortunate to hear the names of Buddhas. So not just the name of say, Shakyamuni, our historical Buddha, but the future Buddha Maitreya, the Buddha of immeasurable light, Amitabha. I just, I just mentioned a few Buddhas. Now you have heard the names of these Buddhas. And within sort of the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it is very good <laughs> to hear the names of these Buddhas, to remember them, to retain them, to hold them in that sense. And so I have a light called name hearing banner my interpretation of that is that it's like about hearing the names of these Buddhas and then one who holds the, its name, one who holds that name receives praise. So that's a kind of an interesting uh, reversal there because usually the idea would be that if I were holding the name of say one of these lights or if I were holding the name of Amitabha Buddha, the idea is I would be 
in a sense, praising that Buddha by remembering them, by recalling them, by chanting their name. You can see that as an act of praise. And so this is kind of interesting because it's saying that, that there's this light that comes from holding the names of Buddhas is one way to interpret it. And that you acquire that light or one who holds that light, I should say, they, are, they get praise. So that's kind of a funny reversal there. I have a light called the banner of delightful thought or the delightful thought banner. One who holds its name is without grief or distress. So this is, this is an idea. I talk about it from time to time. It doesn't get spoken about enough. I think it's not actually a Mahayana Buddhist idea, although it's going to sound like one of those Mahayana Buddhist ideas, but it's a really old part of the practice. And the, the word, it's not the exact word that's used in this poem, but it's the reference, or it would seem to be the reference. There's an idea in the world of Buddhist meditation, and it's an idea that's called manobirani. And it means a delighted mind. The manas, the mano birani, this delighted mind. But it has a particular connotation. It's not just actually about being pleased, being joyful at mind in, in that sense. It, it has a lot to do with this banner, this banner delighted mind or delightful thought. And what they talk about in Buddhism, in the path, is there reaches a certain point where the meditator, and I don't mean just like during a meditation, but I mean in one's practice, in one's cultivation, one reaches a point where, you know, we are normally used to receiving pleasure and delight from things of the world. And so there's a way in which, you know, if I were, uh, if I were very hungry, then I would eat and I would get delighted from the tastes and the flavors or whatever it is, watching something, listening to something, but it, it gives rise to joy. There is this kind of moment in this cultivation that is called this achieving this manobirani, where one is able to basically elicit that same joy, but without anything. Now, in some traditions, this is this sort of delight in meditation itself, like that you that you know, kind of akin to uh, piti or priti, the joy, the rapture of dhyanas or dhyanic states. But there's another kind of way of reading this or looking at this, where it's sort of, and this has to do with a very particular description of of what what one who has manobirani what they are capable of is basically imagining that they have a very very delicious piece of 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 food and actually being able to imagine themselves eating it and and getting the same exact sensations so it's it's it speaks to a certain control or ability of the mind but with basically to where one's imagination is as joyful producing, at, it becomes actually more joyful producing than anything in the world in that sense. And so that's sort of this really cool state of meditation where you're able to sort of cause yourself to be happy. Now, of course, in the deeper meditation traditions, they talk about even that needing to be transcended to reach this kind of upekshik state of equanimity. But on the road to equanimity, one learns to develop this capacity of the mind. It would seem that that's what this is a reference to. It's just the language. But it says, I have a light called the delighted mind or delighted thought banner. 
one who holds its name is without grief and distress. Pretty simple there. Okay. This is a, another banner. I have a light called the banner of pure discipline. Shilla, moral discipline. One who holds its name is free from transgressing precepts. <laughs> so <laughs> the relationship between those two is very straightforward. But I want you to know, though, that there's a kind of a way to read this one. And it's sort of like, basically, this would be a, a Zen reading of it. So a very Zen reading is, I have a light called Banner of Pure Discipline. And one who holds its name, you could read it as that they are incapable of transgressing precepts, but the connotation being that like the person who holds the name of this light, they, they in, a, in a way could drink alcohol, say, but they wouldn't be transgressing a precept. And this is kind of the Zen, like where the Zen tradition comes from, or sorry, I shouldn't say that because this is not the entire Zen tradition. A part, an aspect of some Zen traditions is what they call the antinomian behavior, where they intentionally break rules. And it, it's done in this kind of Dionysian kind of role reversal way, where if, if we've gotten too attached to the rules in this way, then we need to kind of swing the pendulum the other way to find that middle path. And so that's where you find stories of the drunk Zen master who has broken the precepts, has drink, has, has taken alcohol, but because they've done it in such a way, maybe it was because for as an upaya or what have you, there's a way in which they're allowed to transgress rule because for them it's not transgressing the rules this is also an aspect of the vajrayana or the tantric buddhist practice as well where they really start to bend and even in a sense break certain precepts but it's not normal breaking of the precepts it's like you know this other thing and there's a, a way to read this line that way that one who holds the name of this light, which is called pure sh shilla, that they are incapable of transgressing precepts. You could read it the Zen, what they call the Zen lunatic way, or you could read it the way I would, I would read it as one who has this light, like it's just not even in their DNA to, to break precepts. Like they just don't naturally, you know, just don't have a taste for alcohol. Just really don't, don't find it appealing. So that's no problem. <laughs> They're not struggling with it in that sense. So there's a way to read it like that too. So, okay. I have a light called Banner of Subtle Fragrance. One who holds its name is without a stench. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> uh, there's actually a lot to that one. I mean, there's a way in which it's it, there's a way in which it's funny, and I hope you laughed. But the idea of a fragrance in Buddhism, you know, it's already very poetic. But there's um, a a really beautiful part of a a different sutra and it's a sutra where the buddha starts describing all phenomena all dharmas as all having the same flavor the same smell the same taste and it's sort of about all dharmas or all phenomena being empty being dependently originated um it's kind of within that family of thinking, the emptiness family of thinking. But 
it's this metaphor that starts to weave in. It, it's this metaphor that weaves all throughout this particular sutra I'm referring to. And it's about the one flavor, this one taste. And so if you start to pick up on that idea, the, the Buddhist use of that idea of flavor or taste and a way of looking at all phenomena as all having the same flavor and therefore all being equal, even though something might look this way, it might look that way. It all actually has the same smell to it in that sense. That could be this banner of subtle fragrance. And so one who holds the name of that light is without a stench. And that would truly line up, right? Because to say this is stinky and that smells good, that's not equanimity. That's preference. That's judgment. That's this, all of discrimination in that sense. So a way to get free of st stench in that way right is to hold the banner of the light subtle fragrance okay so at this point i want you to know that we are done with the banners so there's no these aren't going to be banners anymore so just heads up on that but we are we we will still still continue to hold the name of these lights and again, my feeling about that word, that term, is that it's about remembering the name and bringing it to mind in a kind of mantra-esque way. Um, that's what that kind of word or that verb means. And so I have a light called the profound dharma, or more exact, the profundity of the dharma. One who holds its name is without doubt and delusion. There you go. Getting rid of, of course, doubt and delusion. Those are kind of two major hindrances or obstacles in that sense. And so the light called the profundity of the Dharma. And oh, and by the way, too, in the Mahayana tradition, if you ever come across the term the profound dharma, the profound dharma is almost invariably emptiness. That's the profound one, the most profound one. And I say this because I only recently learned that the term profound dharma is like Buddhist code for emptiness. So it's not just about how cool and how profound the dharma is, the teachings are. It actually refers to a specific teaching, the teaching of emptiness. That's the profound one. And so to have a light called the profound dharma, the profundity of the dharma, that's kind of a reference to emptiness. And one who holds its name is without doubt and delusion. Pretty straightforward. The next one, and I was, I am hoping to get through all 60 of these. So I'm going to kind of start moving a little forward, like quicker. I have a light called non-abiding, without abiding, without stopping, without resting. One who holds its name is free from being. Right? And that's kind of, that's a very interesting one, right? That something has to like stop to be. And if it's in constant motion, constantly changing, constantly in flux, right? Then being as such becomes a little tricky, right? So that's an interesting one. I have a light called free from discrimination. One who holds its name has nothing to be attached to. So I had already just mentioned a couple of lights ago, mentioned discrimination as being uh, part of the problem here, right? privileging, judging, discriminating, this over that. And so what a great idea, right? A light called free from discrimination. One who holds its name has nothing to be attached to. It's, it's you know, that's a great express route to non-attachment is non-discrimination in that way. <laughs> I have a light called the subtly tall mountain. One who holds its name cannot be moved. 
So the Chinese literally says, I have a light called subtly tall mountain. That's definitely a reference to Mount Meru, Su Meru, the giant mountain, Axis Mundi, the center of the world. And so I have a light called subtly tall mountain. One who holds its name cannot be moved. And that idea of immovability, what's called achala, I already have actually alluded to immovability or achala. I, I called it imperturbability, that idea of not getting aroused, not getting moved in that way. Well, that also is a quality, that quality is also referred to as unshakable, unmovable, like a mountain, they say. And the most immovable mountain is Mount Meru, this, again, this giant mountain. And so this is sort of just this beautiful idea of this light that is called Mount Meru or the subtly tall mountain. And that one who holds on to that name cannot be moved. I have a light called mystery practice. One who holds its name is without attachment. So we saw one before that it's nothing to be attached to. This is the one who holds on to this light or the name of this light is without attachment. And the light is called mystery practice, which definitely sounds tantric. Yeah, and this is basically is saying secret secret mystery practice so you got me i have a light called the practice of liberation one who holds its name is without bondage and entanglements so in in the buddhist tradition of course we are often talking about uh v moksha as it would be called or just moksha liberation and if you have heard that idea, right, a liber ooh, liberation, what does it mean? A really good definition of liberation is being free of bondage and entanglements. And that's, of course, part of the idea is that these delu this delusion, anger, hatred, desire, were enmeshed in them. The Buddha describes them as being like a net, being trapped in these things. And so the idea is, is that being free of the afflictions, being free of those kind of liberates one from that bondage and entanglement. And that's called vimoksha. I have a light called virtuous taming, or you could read it as well subdued. One who holds its name attains pliability. So this is an interesting idea, especially in the Mahayana, or I should say, in the, actually specifically in the Bodhisattva path, a step or a stage in the Bodhisattva path is what they call pliability. It's a very, and it is pliability of the mind, by the way. And well, well, let me clarify with this other word too. So you hear this pop up a lot too, the term taming, subduing, con uh, controlling, mastering, all of these are ways to translate this word. And what's interesting actually about this word, I only recently learned this. I knew the Chinese, but I never knew what the Sanskrit was for this. And I only recently learned that it's Vinaya, that the word Vinaya it, it means literally like, like, di like training, like taming. Like I always mention when you know, one of the titles of the Buddha is human tamer, like we have the term lion tamer. Well, a Buddha is a human tamer because from the perspective of a, of a Buddha, humans are like wild animals, <laughs> completely out of control. And so a Buddha is a human tamer, but that term to tame like a wild animal, 
the verb to do that is vinaya. And so what the vinaya is, what we would normally call the monastic rules, the precepts, it's actually the way to tame a human. <laughs> you could, I, mean, I know it sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, but that is sort of a, a way to understand what the vinaya is. And so whenever you hear this word about the, a Buddha or a Bodhisattva taming, subduing sentient beings, it, it's more sort of about educating, edifying, teaching, and like kind of, you know, learn, teaching people to control themselves in that sense. So that's that word or that idea. And so to do that well, <laughs> to tame well, I have a light called well-tamed or well-subdued. And one who holds that name attains pliability. And I'm not, you know, again, I'm not, I don't want to say this every time, but these are all interpretations, big time interpretations. But I will tell you where that term pliability occurs is, again, it's in the Bodhisattva path. And it's sort of, it has a lot to do with uh, what, are, what are called drishti, uh, views. And of course, in Buddhism, a drishti or a view is like a worldview. It's like the big opinion on what's going on here, right? And if you've studied a lot of Buddhism, in particular, one of the early Buddhist teachings called the Brahma's Net, and this uh, Brahma Jala Sutta, Brahma's Net, in which the Buddha talks about 40, I think, you know, 40 or something different views of this world. Oh, so-and-so over there thinks uh, it's just a bunch of particles constantly spinning around. Oh, no, so-and-so over there says God created the world and we're all, we all go back to God after we die. No, no, so-and-so over there says da 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 So there's all these different opinions and views on what's going on here. And the gist of that sutra, which is kind of, it's really profound. It doesn't get spoken about, I think, enough. The gist of that sutra is that basically it's, it says, yeah, well, Buddhism, it's the practice of not having a view. And that actually, even within that sutra, they talk about, and if that becomes like your view, <laughs> you should get rid of that view too, because we're actually trying to practice not being attached to a view. <laughs> The mind state that is called being pliable, it seems to speak of a bodhisattva reaching a stage of not being rigidly attached to a view and therefore having kind of, I mean, we would just call it being open-minded, I think. But if you really deeply understand a drishti, you know, drishtis are deep, very, very, very deep, you know, and I, I often like to remind people to, to even, you know, go, oh, but I'm agnostic. That is still a view. <laughs> like, like, so there, there's a way in which we all have one in a way. And you have to examine your own mind and behavior actually very carefully to begin to identify what exactly your view is. And then part of the practice is to ease up on thinking that that's right, <laughs> because that's kind of part of the big realization here is that that rigid type of narrow, this is it, this is right, this is the way, everybody else is wrong, they've got to get, it's not exactly like that. So one who, right, attains this uh, light called well-tamed, attains pliability. I have a light that is called unshakable. One who holds its name is free from greed. I would um, kind of, I already kind of commented on a similar one, the one regarding anger, and that if you don't have anger, it's a very powerful position. What's interesting about this one is, is if you remember, or if you keep in mind that the idea of being unshakable is this idea of being unmovable. And I had been referring to it in terms of being perturbed, being angered, or you know, 
getting getting worked up in that way. And so being immovable or being unshakable is nothing gets you worked up, nothing gets you angry. But there's another side to it as well, which is not getting desirous, wanty, cravy in that way. That makes you also immovable. In other words, the idea is, is that if you are kind of actually freed from desire, and I mean totally freed from desire, what, what, could, what could come your way that would move you? That, you know, that would be like, ooh, give me that. And now you're moving, you're moving towards it, you want it, you've been moved. But if you have no desire, if you have no greed in that way, what could move you? It's another uh, very powerful position to be in. You could think of it in, in very, like, a very quotidian terms, like very just like whatever terms, but somebody that with no greed can't be bribed. What, what could you offer someone if they, if they have no desire in that way, right? So you kind of... I like to use that example of bribery because you start to notice being more morally compromised if you have desire. But if you're kind of free of that desire in that way, it's tough to get morally compromised. I have a light called, again, well subdued. And yeah, well subdued, same name as the other light, could be a typo, maybe it's supposed to be a little different, but I have a light called well subdued, one who holds its name, fulfills all discipline, all shila, not the vinaya, but all the shila, the moral discipline. Similar idea regarding taming and moral discipline in that way. I have a light called gathering virtuous practices one who holds its name is without any taint i have a light called much benefit or could also read it as very advantageous i have a light called a lot of advantage a lot of benefit one who, one who hears its name is free from all transgression. So I will tell you that the, the standard English translation didn't notice that here it isn't about uh, one who holds this name. In this instance, it is actually just one who hears this name. And so... I have a light called, sorry, much benefit. One who hears its name is free from all transgression. Benefit in that sense is sort of like punya or merit in that way. Very clear connection to being free of transgressions. I have a light called supreme knowledge seeing. One who hears its name is without bewilderment or perplexity. It's a kind of an interesting term, supreme knowledge seeing, but I believe it's sort of speaking about seeing not with the eyes, but seeing with the mind of intellect in that way. And so the supreme form of that kind of knowledge seeing, and then that's the light. And one who hears its name is without bewilderment. I have a light called seeking benefit. One who hears its name is without anger. I have a light called mind in accord with pleasure. One who hears its name attains peaceful joy. And this is actually very similar to the Manobirani uh, one I mentioned earlier about the delighted mind. Actually, it's very similar uh, words that are used regarding the mind of pleasure. But here it is. I have a light called the mind following pleasure or in accord with pleasure. And that one who hears its name is peacefully joyful. 
I have a light called without burning desire, free of burning desire. One who holds its name comprehends the nature of emptiness. So, you know, just when you thought maybe I had lost it, just when you thought Michael was a little crazy, why is he talking about emptiness when they're talking about lights? <laughs> we get a great verse like this. This is very, you know, very clear reminder of the underlying teachings going on here. So this is a good one. So the light is called without burning desire. One who holds its name comprehends the nature of emptiness. So if I've been doing my job in kind of interpreting these verses well, this fits kind of right in with the theme that we've been kind of getting at here, which is that if you really kind of understand emptiness, then it's kind of hard to be burning with desire in that sense. They kind of go hand in hand in that sense, meaning the lack of understanding of emptiness. Ooh, what's that? Ooh, burning desire right? So now we kind of start to pick up on a theme because the next one says, I have a light called Shunyata Asvabhava would be its Sanskrit name. And it's about the lack of self-nature of emptiness. So Svabhava is this idea of self-nature, Svabhava. And this light is called emptiness is without svabhava, shunyata asvabhava. One who holds that name, shunyata asvabhava, transcends language games. So this isn't the first time in this sutra, in these poems, it, this isn't the first time we've encountered this idea of transcending language games. So I'm not exactly sure how to translate this, this term. I think they translate it as wordplay. Yeah, wordplay is how they trans translate it. I go just with this idea of language games, but it's the idea of, or it would seem to refer to sort of like the the way in which you can do tricky things with language and i don't mean uh, magic and spells i mean through kind of like rhetoric and through kind of forms of logic or illogic you can kind of oh okay let me be more, more clear this seems to be a reference to a form of debate where people are really good with their language and very persuasive, but they don't actually say anything. They're, it's just a bunch of like word games, play, playing with words, and it sounds smart. And it sounds like they're saying something really important or deep. And part of the rhetoric, but by which I mean part of the persuasion, is convincing you that, you that you're not smart enough to understand the argument. And so, so you, you kind of acquiesce because you, you couldn't follow the argument when really their argument was unfollowable. That's, that's wordplay, that's language games in this sense. And so one who holds the, this name, that emptiness is without svabhava transcends all language games. Yeah, and I wanna remind you the first time that we saw this, which was verse 91 of those first hundred verses, the Buddha said that he has a light called transcending language games and that it arose from extolling omniscience or praising omniscience. I'm definitely not gonna get fully into this because we would be here for months and months working on this sutra, but there's a thing that starts to happen 
where in the first hundred verses, for example, in this one, the Buddha said that I have a light called transcending language games. It arose from praising omniscience. Now the Buddha is doing this thing where he has a light called this and that it arises or one who holds it transcends language games. So you could probably really go much deeper with this poem and start going back so that, for example, in this case, praising omniscience has something to do with emptiness not having a self nature is what I'm getting at. Like you could really start to decode this whole thing, which I'm not going to do, but I want you to know that you could do it. <laughs> okay. All right. I have a light called without refuge or without stopping for refuge. One who holds its name is unshakable. So that kind of goes along with the one that we came saw earlier about something that doesn't abide, never rests, it transcends being. Kind of a similar idea here, but this is regarding seeking refuge without stopping for refuge. And one who holds the name of that light again becomes imperturbable, immovable, unshakable. Make sense? I have a light called being free from perplexity. One who holds its name doesn't monkey around. So I won't actually, well, how do they translate this one? Oh yeah, so they just go with, I have a light called free from perplexity. That's how I did it. Um, one who holds its name does not vacillate. So my guess is, is that this expression which literally in Chinese is like monkey business. It's basically like I translated it with the English euphemism monkey around because I think it, it fits the, what the Chinese is. But the Chinese more explicitly means this idea of kind of vacillating, jumping from this and like, no, 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 let's do this. No, 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 let's do that. No, 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 let's do that. Like this kind of indecisiveness or jumping around. And you can kind of attain a state of not doing that, which is called holding the name of this light, which is called free from perplexity. I have a light called nowhere to abide. One who holds its name is free from the darkness of ignorance. So this is related to a few of the other ones that we've seen tonight, which is the idea of abiding, resting, or stopping somewhere. We mentioned this idea of, I'm not exactly sure how it was worded, but it was about not abiding. This one is, I have a light called nowhere to abide. <laughs> there's, there's nowhere to actually do the abiding. So you can forget about abiding because there's just nowhere to do it. I have a light called nowhere to abide. One who holds its name is free from the darkness of ignorance. And you really can, now all of these, you can, you can say to yourself, this has something to do with emptiness, doesn't it? And you'll be right. <laughs> I have a light called satisfied with the physical body one who holds its name will forever not receive another one so this one's a little tricky the two tricky words are well actually it's the only one tricky word i have a light called and it literally means done with the bot with the physical body. I have a light called satisfied or done with the physical body. One who holds its name will forever not receive another physical body. So that's a reference to reincarnation. Um, that's kind of the language that 
at least the way the Chinese are taught, they speak about receiving a new body. That's just the way the language works, especially in classical Chinese. And the verb, or I actually, whatever that is, yeah, verb for being satisfied with the physical body. If when you go really digging into what this word means, it's it's literally like like if you like if you ate two you were full you're satisfied you're done but it's also like i'm good i'm i'm good in other words it's kind of talking about like in terms of the cycle of samsara in terms of the cycle of birth death and rebirth birth death and rebirth the idea here is, and this is a very Buddhist idea. I, I say this often in my talks about reincarnation. In some traditions, not, not Buddhist ones, but in some other traditions, we keep coming back. We, we, we suffer birth, death, and rebirth, and birth, death, and rebirth because of our past actions what you might think of as karma, that we've done a bunch of stuff, maybe last week, maybe last year, maybe even other lifetimes. And, be, and so as a result of the kind of the wave of all of that past action, we're being reborn. So says many other traditions concerning reincarnation. The Buddha has always been saying, the reason why we keep, get it, keep getting reincarnated is because we love it here. We, we love the stuff here. We love sex, sex. We love food. We love all of these things. So actually, when we die and are traveling the Bardo, they talk about basically you get a choice and we all keep wanting, loving, coming back. This is suggesting that when you're good, when you've had enough, <laughs> when you're done, then you will not receive another one. Simple as that. So I have a light called without anything to grasp. <laughs> so this isn't a light called ungraspable. It's a light where there's just nothing to grasp. One who holds its name is free from the written word. That's an interesting one. That's an interesting one, right? <laughs> well, let me tell you the next one and then we'll deal with both of these together. I have a light called without the ignorance of being. One who holds its name is free from the spoken word. So those two kind of are together. So I have a light that is called without anything to grasp. One who holds its name is free from the written word. And I have a light called without, be, without the ignorance of being. One who holds its name is free from the spoken word. A, a funny way to think about that is very, very quickly. So right over there, just, just off screen, right over there, I've got something but you don't know what it looks like because I haven't shown it to you. You don't know what it sounds like because I haven't brought it to the microphone, right? You don't know what it smells like. You don't know what it tastes like. You don't know what it feels like. You really don't have anything to go on. What's it called? Just write it down. Just write down and, and, then, and then we'll be good, right? So <laughs> that over there right now is ungraspable because you don't have anything to go on. Again, you don't have any sense media. You don't have any lakshana. So again, I, ha I have a light. The Buddha has a light that is called without anything to grasp. One who holds its name is free from the written word. Because again, just, just write down what it's called. <laughs> I have a light called without the ignorance of being. Just like you think that over there is, but Without the ignorance of being, one becomes free of the spoken word. Because again, there's no word for that. You, or you don't have a word for it. I have a light called without anywhere to go. One who holds its name 
has knowledge of the future. Now we're getting very koan, is getting very zen in that way, right? So if you understand nowhere to come from, nowhere to go, that is the idea of suchness, tathata. So interesting that it, having a light, he has a light called without anywhere to go. So that's very much understanding suchness. And one who holds the name of that light has knowledge of the future. I just want you to see how they're related. It rather paradoxically, <clears throat> because if something had somewhere to go, it would have a future. So this is saying a light called without anywhere to go. One who holds his name has knowledge of the future. I just want you to see how they're related. I'm not even saying anything about what it means, but just that there's a relationship between those two ideas. Yeah, Tanya. Maybe knowledge of the future is just that like it doesn't exist. That's a, That would be a good, a, a good way to read it. Yeah, like there, it's not that like you're looking into the future. It's just like it's not there. Ex Ooh, exactly. That's how I read it. That's how I would read it. <clears throat> Similarly, I have a light called the universal edge and limit. <laughs> the Samanta Paryanta. One who holds its name has knowledge of the past. <laughs> I have a light called without equal or without peer. One who holds its name has known the cessation of outflows. So this is a term that you do not see very much in Mahayana Buddhism, but it's a very, very, very big part of the early school. And I'll tell you why. So the basic idea of an outflow, and I forget the, the Sanskrit for this term, for, for outflow. I can't, I can't recall it, but it's an interesting idea. And there's two ways to understand it. One way the more general way of an outflow is it actually has a lot to do with something I've already mentioned, which is the manobirani, which is this idea of being able to delight one's own mind. If you're, if you're not able to do that and you're not able to withdraw and you're not able to peacefully abide in tranquility, then there's a way in which your desires or whatever it is, they kind of flow outward. They flow out towards these things. And you can kind of start to even kind of visualize and see it that way, that when you are drawn to a visual thing, it's as if your attention is flowing out towards it. They, an arhat, someone who has attained the way in the early Buddhist path, what makes you an arhat was technically defined as the ending of outflows, cutting off outflows. But there's another way to understand outflows, and it's more literal. And it, it, these things are always tricky, but the basic idea of an outflow was the emission of semen for men. But that was an outflow. And there was a way in which they talk about it, because remember, early Buddhism was much more concerned about sex and sexuality than the Mahayana tradition. So they were much more focused on ejaculation for men. And that was an outflow. And so what they talked about was that you've got to stop your outflow and you reach a point where you stop intentionally outflowing but you still have accidental occasions, but then you reach a certain point, again, at least for the male, for the monks, you reach a point where you no longer have ejaculation at all. You no longer emit 
semen. And so that's called the ending of outflows. And that was considered a great accomplishment, of course, in the early Buddhist tradition that was much more concerned about the sexual desire in that way. I've read that they associate the ending of menstruation and the menstrual blood with women. So with the bhikshunis that they reach a point of no more outflows where they're not uh, menstruating anymore, but that seems like it's a later interpretation. So could take that for what it's worth. And achieving such a state uh, uh, as that, by the way, was considered again, state of an arhat. So where it says, I have a light called without equal, without peer, one who holds its name has known the cessation of outflows. Just, you know, it's considered an exalted state either way. <clears throat> I have a light called the self-realized sage. One who holds its name knows the highest or knows the most high. I have a light called stainless. One who holds its name is free from all attachments. And that uh, the, the word for stainless is that word Vimala. So I have a light called Vimala. One who holds that name is free from all attachments. I have a light called free from dust. One who holds its name is without darkness. I have a light called without amorous captivation. One who holds its name is free from all dependencies. So speaking of sexuality and the sexual desire. I have a light, he says, called without amorous captivation, right? One who holds its name is free from all dependencies. And when I first read that verse, it, it made me think of a, one of the same, something the, the Buddha supposedly said, he, the Buddha supposedly said that if there was a desire greater than sexuality, he wouldn't have been able to achieve enlightenment. <laughs> so the idea is it's a very, very, very strong desire in that way. Um, it, it's so deep, actually, the idea is it may be, you know, that, well, I don't want to get too into this, but the, the idea of being very deeply programmed in terms of evolution and biology, we're deeply programmed to perpetuate the species in that way. So it's a very, very strong form of desire, the sexual form. And so when the Buddha said, yeah, if there was something stronger than that, I never would have attained enlightenment. I, I think of that with this idea of that I have a light called without amorous captivation, one who holds his name is free from all dependencies, because that's considered a great dependency in that way. I have a light called the most supreme high. One who holds its name destroys all arguments. I have a light called small strong year is the literal Chinese transliteration or translation, I should say. One who holds its name completes the six practices. So this one seems to be, I have, I could not find what these, you know, you know, Chinese is tricky. You can know what these things mean, but you don't know what they mean. So this is a three character expression. I have a light called the small strong year. Couldn't find a reference to what that was, what it would be in Sanskrit. And then it says that one who holds that name completes the six practices. Are those the six paramitas? Maybe, probably, but it doesn't use the word paramita in any way. It uses a different term. So that one's going to remain a mystery, quite a mystery, I think. I have a light called the supreme most honored. 
one who holds its name has unobstructed wisdom. I have a light, or actually here the poem switches the language a little bit, and so it might be, excuse me, it might be more appropriate to say, I have a luminousness, because it shifts to talking about the light as an object to its actual luminosity. So I have a luminousness, and then it also shifts the grammar to a passive, which I think is important. So I have a, I have a luminousness, the name of which is swift. One who holds its name is completely accomplished in monastic discipline. The reason why I mention this is that it, it's doing another beautiful poetic thing where if, if I'm reading this correctly, it's trying to do this thing where it's saying, I have a light or a luminousness and the, the name, it's, it's, a, it's quick. Like, so meaning they're doing a double thing where it's the name of the light, but it describes the light. It's a quick light, it's fast, it's swift. And linguistically, this is so funny. I mean, this kind of thing. So for example, the next one, he says, I have a light or a luminousness, the name of which has characteristics or lakshana. And so it's like, wait, is the name of the light has lakshana? Like, is that the name of the light? It, ha it, ha like it has lakshana or is it a name with lakshana so, or with characteristics? So that's kind of funny. I have a light or a luminousness, the name of which has characteristics. One who holds its name has comprehended the profound dharma. And we know what the profound dharma is, don't we? I have a light called, or I have a luminousness, the name of which is without characteristics. One who holds its name is free from being arrogant. I have a light or a luminousness, the name of which is unborn. Anudpana, birthless. One who holds that name catches the unattainable. All right. Oh, we made it. I have a light called Recalling the Buddha, by which all the Tathagatas are praised. By cultivating all the practices of many Buddhas, I then attained such lights as these. The light manifesting from the body of the Buddha is as numerous as the dust motes in thousands of kotis, millions of lands, immeasurable millions of lands such as this, their amount like the sands of the ocean. And each of these lights, as numerous as all those dust motes, each contains a large retinue of lights. These lights reach all lands without Buddhas and transform into the pure body of a Tathagata. A Tathagata expounding the most profound, most subtle Dharma, and establishing sentient beings in kashanti, patient tolerance. I have a light known as Buddha. It can lead sentient beings to abide in the way of the Buddha. I have a light known as Dharma. Its pure radiance is flawless. I have a light known as the Sangha. It is praised by all Buddha Tathagatas. I have a light called Visuddhi purity. Its light is most superb, superb and hard to attain. I have a light 
known as blossom. It benefits sentient beings, ripening them. I have a light called Brahma, or it's called Chakra, or it's called Deva. It's called Moon, called Naga, called Yaksha, called Asura, Gandharava, or it has the name King, or Lady, or it is called Girl, or Boy. Like this, all of these different kinds of lights, each by means of virtuous dharma, transform into their respective kind, able to cause immeasurable kotis, millions of beings, to attain complete awakening. I have a light called pranya, or it's called shila, or it's called kindness, or it's called compassionate joy, or it's called lamp, perfume, music, Thus, each of these lights is named for its primary function. This light was achieved as a result of embracing immeasurable kinds of beings. I have a light called honored. It is praised by all Buddha Tathagatas. This light was achieved as a result of being ever reverent of the Dharma taught by the Buddha. The kinds of sentient beings seen by the Buddha eye a single hair pore emits a shield or orb of light and or of lights. And each of those lights is surrounded by its own retinue of light. Each light in accord with the thoughts of the minds of all sentient beings covered in Buddha light, ripening to maturity. If someone hears of these lights explained and they are able to bring forth pleasant, delightful joy. This person must have already heard this sutra from a Buddha in the past. Boom. <laughs> All right, so that's exactly where I wanted to get to. That's the exact end. The Buddha is about to switch his flow up again. It's going to get a different cadence, and we're about to drift into some whole other section. So this is a wild sutra. So I hope you're enjoying it so far. I know it's a little bit different. So uh, that's it for me.